Good evening, depending on, on, on where you are. And Natalie and myself are sitting in Milton Keynes in the in the UK. Um, this is the first um, coaching webinar after the summer, if you think of the summer as in the Global North uh, summer. So we are delighted to kick the new series of, of uh, coaching webinars. And today we have with us uh, two wonderful, I mean, I. The topic for today is um, is just talking about open education, OER, OEP in in school. So we're going back to basics, which, which I think is actually um, well, not exactly going back to basics, but going back to the beginning where things should start in in school. So we have with us um, Connie Blom Blomgren or Constance Blom Blomgren, who is based at the Center for Distance Education in in Athabasca. And Verena, who is a PhD researcher and also works at the University of, of Calgary. And I am so happy that these uh, women are here with us today because they are fabulous experts and, uh, I mean, apart from, you know, really nice people. And thank you so much for taking, for taking our invitation. So um, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks so much, Bea. It's great to be here. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Connie Blomgren speaking. And um, we have a slide deck for you. Um, and uh, they're a little bit not quite in the right order, so we're going to uh, look at the first two and then jump to the very beginning. And uh, so I'm just going to move to the next slide. And Brina, if you'd like to say hello. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> there you go. I'm just going to let you lead Connie right now because the slides are out of order and I will jump in as we go. Okay. Just okay. there we go. Right. So really what I just wanted to uh, say is that uh, we have this uh, slide deck that's going to give an overview of how Verena and I um, work together on a media project about K-12 OER. Uh, then when we were preparing for the seminar, we, our webinar, we decided what would be useful. And so we came up with three questions that her and I are going to just briefly discuss back and forth. And you can listen to our discussion or certainly enter into it if you have questions or if you want to take the mic. And then if there's audience questions, we'll move into those. Um, but we just thought it would be useful to um, provide the context of our project so that everyone has an understanding of how it, we came to be as, as, a, as a team. And um, so we'll just begin with that. Uh, and Verena, I'll uh, pass it off once in a while and so just wait for when I can do that. I'll run the slides, I guess, for now. So we have uh, what's called the Multiple, Multiply K-12 Open Educational Resources Project. Um, it was funded through the Alberta government. They had a one-time funding envelope. Um, I applied and I was successful. So then I had to hire some people to try and create these podcasts and videos to support uh, teacher capacity for graduate credit through Athabasca courses. And um, I was still relatively new at Athabasca and certainly new into the world of OER. So I think I had a very grand idea and it was great to have Raina because she was, she was very knowledgeable and she was a great addition. Part of the reason why it was called Multiply K-12 OER is because with the capacity of not just the numbers of teachers in K-12 but also all those students that they teach because not all um, uh, students, once they finish high school, go into college or university. They go directly into the work, workforce. And yet, if they are exposed to the concept of OER during their K-12 to years, they will have that for the rest of their lives. So to me, this idea of K-12 to and OER, it, there, is a comp there is a very complex multiplying effect going on, and hence the name. So um, ABOER, if you just type that in, you'd get to this website. Um, they have some tools. Um, it's not as active because the funding has uh, decreased, um, although there is still a, a vibrant group of people interested in OER in, in the province of Alberta. 
Now, the uh, funding was for higher education, and they were interested, of course, for, uh, for us to go into K-12 and uh, this idea of professional learning for OER um, within Alberta and, uh, and for um, higher ed and for K-12 is very, very immature. And uh, people are doing open practices, but not calling it open practices. And they are very young in their understanding of the capacity and potential of what is OER. So very um, in the very uh, young areas of it. Uh, the resources that we eventually created are located here um, at the Bolt multi-authored blog. And you can see Verena's uh, jumping in there pointing. Um, and there are um, some great resources there, uh, three videos th uh, that talk about um, open educational practices from the point of view of K-12 teachers working here in Alberta, and then uh, podcasts that uh, discuss um, teaching. You'll, you'll see in a minute, there's a list here. So, um, Raina, maybe you might want to talk about this a bit. Okay, so at the beginning, when I came into the project, as you can see, like anyone who knows me, we have to make it real, make it visible, and make it for everyone. If we don't have something that's relevant and authentic, I'm like, why bother? So we really focused on the question, our, our big idea, our guiding question was how can we increase awareness, use, and capacity for OER for K-12 teachers? And uh, I just want to say at the beginning what was really intriguing is most of the teachers didn't have an awareness of what OER was or, or the, the, the letters or the words. So making it visible, real, and for everyone was really interesting when we were almost speaking another language. So uh, we'll just go to the next slide to see about how we learned about learning about how many different ways and interpretations there are um, about what people are doing about OER. So you can go to the next one. Yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so we had, uh, we made a list uh, with uh, Verena's expertise and my knowledge of the area as well. And we went through and decided that we would interview a variety, variety of experts in um, OER. And this is how we actually first connected up with Bea. Or actually, I think Verena knew Bea before, but I had not. So that was really a, a, a nice connection. And this uh, world of OER uh, just continues to grow. It's just really fascinating. So um, whoever, whenever you take on OER, just be prepared for this um, growth in your professional learning network, because it just it really does echo out many, many times. So you can see the list, um, some very um, interesting people, uh, some great researchers, um, some names of people who have done a lot of work for OER, especially in higher ed, because within K-12, to it's very hard to find anyone who's done much research or, um, you know, it's not as, a, as, a, as an established uh, area of research yet. So we made some video recordings, and we uh, used uh, Kimmons' uh, research on evaluating both closed and open source textbooks. Um, and Royce Kimmons was just so gracious. He was just really helpful, and uh, he uh, provided some great um, uh, clips for our um, um, the podcast. Pardon me. And uh, so then, when we were using his work uh, for the basis of the video recordings. We had pre and post video interviews. We uh, filmed the workshop itself. And um, it was really fascinating to see these teachers work through their understanding of what is OER and how that changed over time through the course of the day. It was just a one day event. And we really decided that, we're, that there were, are definitely some wicked problems of OER. So the heuristic for the practitioner videos, we use the open pedagogy model from Hegarty, which is really um, significant. I believe that it uh, holds together very well for K-12 to as well as for higher ed, which was her original audience when she wrote it. And we did interview um, Bronwyn, and it was, she was very gracious as well. And the original diagram was in black and white. Um, I asked her if she had any preference around color. She said no. I asked her if she had any preference in how we arranged the spokes on the on the um, 
I don't know, Mandela or Circle, whatever you want to call it there. And she said um, that the order to her wasn't all that important, depending um, on one factor alone, though, that everything flowed from participatory technologies. And so that's why it's at the top in the 12 o'clock position, and that's why it's also in the red. So you can see the heuristic um, in more detail on the Bolt um, uh, multi-author blog where all the sources are stored. So you, from the participatory technologies, all these other aspects flow. And uh, are, it's a very interesting, rich um, model, and I'm doing research around it currently. So we have the three videos. Um, they all were designed with universal design for learning principles right from the get-go. Um, they're CC licensed. Uh, they're, uh, uh, the transcripts are there. Um, so we tried to make it as accessible to people as possible. And then and also when it came to deciding how to spend this money, rather than just going straight to videos, because in parts of Canada and our far north and also in what we call the near north, Bandwidth can be such a difficulty for schools and also so expensive if you are, you know, a teacher working from home that, um, you know, to decrease the, um, the uh, download of videos was an idea that we had and this is why we went to some of the podcasts instead. And it also allowed us to have more content versus less because it's just not as expensive to produce a podcast episode than it, than it is a video. Um, Brina, you want to talk anything about the podcast creation? Um, like for me, what I've noticed about the podcast creation is now that I work, or last year when I was working in a school district, the number of teachers who asked me, how do I create podcasts has increased dramatically. And also when we think about storytelling, and um, I recently actually posted, I'll put that on there in a second, about the idea of the open narrative um, and the idea of how do we tell our stories openly. Um, and that's what I think of when I think of K-12 open research. It's how do we tell our stories. And that's how these podcasts, or the, it came from the idea from these podcasts, really, because they're all the stories of how open um, educational practice and, and open learning came to be around the world. Yes, and so you can see that we divided them up into different categories, and we also listed um, who what, who's uh, d uh, talking about the topic. So rather than going with an expert just talking about uh, uh, their experiences. We divided it up by topic and so then there's a variety of voices and opinions on any one particular uh, concept such as the open mind and learning etc. And again this allows people wanting to maybe uh, use the podcast for research or scholarly purposes if you're wanting to you know just find out what Bea thinks about um, the, these concepts, you can look to see who's um, been interviewed. So we were trying to make it as flexible, as accessible, as easy to use as possible. Now what I think is a really nice addition is that uh, we, we have this whole section that talked about uh, copyright in Canada for K-12 education. We had these uh, scenarios. Um, so there's an overview by an intellectual property lawyer of the Canadian copyright law as it um, is interpreted for uh, Canadian uh, K-12 teachers. And then we gave some examples to help just sort of help uh, people understand our current context. So um, as you can imagine, uh, although this was only six months that we worked from the very beginning of receiving the funding right to the very end, uh, so we were flat out busy the whole time. Um, we came across many reflections, um, mine being that this idea that in both higher education in K-12 in um, Alberta and in Canada, the understanding of OER and open practices, open learning environments, as Verena will talk about, this is still very, very um, immature, still growing. Um, I think there's rich potential. And I think that it, the timing is very strong because of uh, curriculum changes um, in uh, provinces occurring right now. So there is this openness towards digital um, environments and looking towards uh, trying to ensure that uh, 
teachers understand OER, um, administrators, uh, librarians, um, IT professionals. It's very complex, plus, of course, this whole layer of uh, you know, working with uh, students under the age of 18 or 16 in some areas. So, uh, Verena, your comments about your insights? Sorry, okay. I'm gonna, okay, you go ahead. Yes, I'll just being yeah. cut off by the audio. Um, <laughs> the, um, so what I um, really focused on is when Hegarty said to you, um, participatory practice is so important and really the focus for for open pedagogy. I think that is so essential for K-12 and that really. So for me, what I am working on and developing is guided by um, the definitions from Cronin, who is a GoGN uh, colleague as well. Um, oh, could we just go back one? Right. Um, I've started to really think about a definition that describes what open educational practice is for K-12, rather than try to focus on an open educational resource definition, it's how, how are we using, it, it, I'm not saying we're not using open educational resources, it's just how, how are we learning openly. So um, in K-12 learning context, it describes an intentional design, and that intentionality is very important. So it's designing for openness from the beginning, and that is from a technological approach, but also a mindset approach from the beginning, that, that you're we're focusing on expanding the learning opportunities for all learners beyond classroom walls by collaboratively and individually sharing and building knowledge and encouraging networked participation by interacting with others from multiple cultural perspectives. And in this day and age, when we think about what's going on um, politically as well, I think it's really important to think about the possibilities of open learning. So this open educational practice um, definition other than just Croton is actually brought in from multiple perspectives across theory and and pra cur currently practice and research. So we have like the network teachers um, talked about from Kuros, the open learning design from, is it Canole? Because all of you know her, but I don't. And I think it's Canole that you say, <laughs> nodding Bea, okay. Um, then we have participatory culture, Jenkins. And connected learning, especially in the United States, I think is really taking a, a, a next step in terms of the integration of formal and informal learning networks. But when I look at connected learning, I think about who is guiding the learning. Is it coming from the formal learning environment or is it coming from the informal learning environment? And so that's, anyway, that's a dichotomy or difference I, I'm seeing. There's the personal learning that works with Drexler, the open readiness in Cronin. And then Greenhow is uh, one of the only um, K-12 focused researchers looking at social media spaces for learning um, and that social media integration. And finally, very important to K-12 learning context, the, the networked publics, but also the data and privacy and, and, and how we're dealing with security and safe learning spaces. And underneath, you'll see that the main theorists are, are philosophers are Vygotsky, Dewey, and Barth. But as I'm getting into my research right now, I'm really noticing the influence of critical pedagogy and frere as well so i'm seeing how that um, will play out so really at this moment the indicators of open educational practice putting it out there designing for sharing participatory learning global learning networks safe learning spaces and expanded learning environments for those who like themes like martin weller as i was reading his post earlier today and i would love to hear some criticism or some feedback on that um, and just you just went a little too fast there, Connie, but before we get to the question, we did write a paper that you just there you go. Um, and it talks about like where it where open educational practice is right now in K-12 learning environments and where it's going, and it's already outdated, which is great. So that's wonderful. And of course, it's CC licensed and open to the world. Okay, there you go, Connie. Take it away. Question the questions that we're going to ask each other. Right. So Verena and I, we were just having a conversation on the telephone about this presentation. And it, we seem to um, cluster around three different concepts. And so we made them into questions. And um, perhaps this is a question that uh, many of you have uh, sort of struggled with in your own way, in your own context. But 
I think many people are still thinking, this, why isn't OER and open practices taking off in K-12 education within Alberta or in other parts of Canada? And so uh, Verena and I were talking about this question, about why, even though there's these curriculum changes, as far as I am aware, within the province of Alberta, which is a well-noted province within Canada uh, for its uh, progressive um, and high-quality education. Teachers are paid very well in Alberta in K-12. Um, there's high, uh, high stakes testing, for better or for worse here, um, although some of the emphasis has been decreased in the last couple of years. Um, there's a lot of support for students with uh, disabilities in relative terms to other locations. I'm always, you know, I always think they, they could spend more on education um, because, of course, that's an, an important area. But in relative terms, um, I do know that sometimes P, uh, families will move to Alberta specifically because of the supports that are available if they have students with, you know, children with disabilities of different kinds, especially if they're on the Asperger's uh, spectrum. So there is some very strong progressive elements in Alberta, and yet when it comes to discussions around OER and open practices and support for OER sharing, um, et cetera, um, the understanding of it is, um, kind of all over the map and, as I would say, again, very immature. And so it's frustrating uh, from um, my perspective. I keep trying to knock on different kinds of doors, metaphorically and literally, trying to get somebody with some authority, some um, ability to kind of really make some things happen because I really believe in the capacity of OER to support so many of the changes that we are needing in education. Um, with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, document that came from the Government of Canada and its um, desire to um, be accountable for past injustices with Indigenous people in Canada, OER allows us opportunity for land-based knowledge, for contextualized knowledge, for um, participatory sharing of um, different resources that are unique to an area. So whether Indigenous or non-Indigenous, um, rural or urban, uh, the far north, the near north, um, textbook publishers um, only sort of tend to um, focus on narratives that are um, you know, it's not often urban centric, but also sometimes when they try to reach out to find, you know, sort of examples that are, uh, a, a, you know, a rural context. What's happening in rural Manitoba is not the same as rural BC, right? And Canada is such a huge country and so geographically diverse and so um, much a community of communities, which is really what the word Canada means, a, a community of communities, that OER, OER um, open practices have this potential to actually um, allow uh, many multiple um, perspectives to come forward, to be shared, etc. And it's just not happening yet in any substantial way that I'm aware of in K-12. So I'm very, as I say, kind of um, disappointed about some of that. Uh, and I can't really say that I know why. Um, Verena, what do you think? Why isn't it taking off? Um, well, I think some of the reasons are that from the very beginning, as we learned, that people don't understand what we mean by open educational practices, and they don't understand the foundational ideas of the sharing. And that goes along with the legalities behind it as well, when we're talking about copyright um, and that aspect. Uh, however, I don't think that open learning isn't happening, and I don't think that open educational practice isn't happening. I just, I don't think that we're necessarily defining it as such. Um, and I remember that um, when I was even looking at the at the common literature, there are many, many themes that have those common attributes that I listed or indicators of open educational practice, but they're listed in different domains within the research. And I think part of what I'm doing too and others are trying to connect those domains and bring them together. Um, I'm actually an OER fellow in the with the United States um, focus as well. Uh, and 
the difference between the mentality in that group and the Gojian group is really interesting as well in terms of their mindset, what they believe in in terms of research, what their focus is, the direction they're going with that we are. So I think part of the problem is it's all over the place in higher ed, <laughs> let alone <laughs> in K-12. And in K-12, we don't have the time to worry about is it connected learning? Is it open learning? Is it this? Like we don't have that practice. We, that expertise or or mindset we just want to get it done we just want to use the stuff we want to like play with things we want to connect with people um so i think that the efforts uh, like dan just pointed out the efforts on um competency-based learning competency-based learning is huge in the united states as well like how do we compare competency-based learning to open learning well i could tell you exactly how to do that i could stand and explain it but those connections aren't being made in terms, and I totally agree with you, Cardi, that you need to have advocates who understand at policy level positions the importance of using open educational resources. At, at, like, because really, we think that uh, people save money in higher education using open educational resources. Imagine the impact if we used OER in K 12 around the world, where everyone is given publicly, not everyone. I can't say everyone globally, many people are given public funding to support um, curriculum and content creation minimally. It, it would be mind blowing if we actually introduced OER effectively into K-12. Um, I agree. Yes, Dan, yeah. state legislators mm -hmm. can't spell OER. It's <laughs> very well said, but that's also in Canada, so we will own that as well. Anyway, and, yeah. and I'm glad people are bringing up comments in our, in our, uh, our back channel here so please put comments in the chat as well yes and um i jenny's right uh she listed quite a few um you know regarding this idea that publishers textbooks are safe uh, that's not just among school district administrators you know uh, teachers are such um the demands on teaching just grow. It doesn't matter how many years of experience you have. It's just there's always more to do. And so you're looking for ways to ensure qual quality, something that you can trust. This is some of uh, the area that I'm investigating right now in my research is this whole concept of trust and its importance for uh, K-12 to teachers to be able to feel that what they are using with their students is of a high quality, is you know, friendly uh, for them to use, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's, uh, it's very complicated. I think, I actually think K-12 open educational practices are more complicated than higher education because you're, there's the whole layer, as Verena talked about, was this layer of um, privacy and um, what's allowed, et cetera. And, um, and, the, and I'm not saying that everything has to be, like publishers and their textbooks are, are not to be uh, around. I just think that we can have both. And I think both would be perhaps you know, a, a great opportunity for all sorts of opportunities for teachers to uh, select what's best for their class, for their context. There's many challenges. But I think, uh, yes, this, this lack of understanding, and I just, I think, you know, if, if we, we have to be careful in K-12 uh, around when, um, when we talk about the cost savings, because as soon as you start talking about cost savings, people could jump into it thinking that they're going to save money, when really what, to me, it's a, it's a shifting of money away from what you would spend on textbooks to other uh, requirements that would support this network of uh, librarians and IT and um, the whole complex uh, system that would truly create an effective repository and a sharing culture, a reviewing culture. Like There are many, many layers to it. So moving to our and next also, question here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just want to add that the, the Creative Commons, absolutely, Helen. The sooner people understand what Creative Commons means and how we could use it, the better. On the other hand, that's what we're going to get to. How do you see the difference between making OER and using OER? I don't know. We at my district really try to make OER 
last year. So we put in a concerted effort to make it going to the extent to actually put the metadata for the Creative Commons licenses. It is really, really hard. It is really, really difficult. One of the big differences is in higher ed, you have many people who help support you in making open educational resources. Not everyone and not every time. But for example, if you're making an online course, you have an often have an instructional designer, you have a subject matter, uh, matter expert, you'll have your IT person. So you have a variety of people. In some contexts, I can see Bea's face, I'll say. In, in, in many contexts, especially in the United States and Canada, we'll say then, I'll be specific. However, in K-12, you do not at all. You have a teacher. And if the teacher decides to use open educational resources or make open educational resources, then they have to do it mostly by themselves from scratch. And we had the tech department and our, our central office trying to make open educational resources. And we found it incredibly challenging. It wasn't easy. But the big difference is when you're making OER, uh, and 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 as, as opposed to just using something that's already made, you really understand why you're doing it and why it's so important to make it easy and uh, and the affordances to be able to use it are so necessary in that whole concept of designing for learning. And you're also really it's very, it becomes very important to be collaborative and participatory because it's exhausting and you need other people to help you. So I think there's a huge difference between making an open educational resource and using an open educational resource like a textbook. Okay, Connie, what do you think? Oh yes, I think so. I think that uh, this is a great exercise for people to understand um, the complexities uh, of making OER and then using OER. And I think that this is where uh, it's, um, it's a great challenge. I guess it's one of these wicked problems that we mentioned earlier. It's this, um, sometimes you don't understand the complexity of, of many things until you have that experience, going back to Dewey and experiential learning. So the process of making OER would help you understand what would be required to support uh, classroom teachers in, in, uh, in making their own OER. But on the other hand, they're so busy that you don't want them just making OER. You really want them to start moving into you know, phase two, phase three, the more sophisticated reuse and revision and maybe remixing of materials, right? And even the concept of remix is um, you know, from K to 12, uh, in literacy studies, there's a lot of discussion of remix culture. But uh, that hasn't really percolated up into higher education and even uh, to some degree uh, within understandings um, by people in um, educational, position, uh, educational leadership positions, this understanding of remix culture and what that means and how this um, you know, participatory technologies and this ability to uh, shift things around is a very sophisticated skill set and it involves of course critical literacy skills, pedagogical literacy skills and so this movement um, really from um, I think it's just such a substantial difference and this is where I think having people who have the positions of power and authority to support and create the, the networks, um, you actually making some OER would be a really interesting exercise because then they would go, oh, I see how complicated this is and I think we need X, Y, and Z and A, B, C and all of the different pieces to fit together. Because I think sometimes what happens is that it's just like a document that they might see or they might hear it as a buzzword and they go, oh yeah, well that's sort of like, I don't know. It's, it is such, to me, it is such a fundamental shift in how you do education. It is a substantial shift. And, you know, uh, when they talked about the age of the computer and how it was similar to the printing press and how that changed everything, people bandied that around. 
And I think we're living that now. We are living this transition and we are just in the dark about some of the changes it really means. And um, it, it'll take quite a long time, I think, for some of these things to um, be fully implemented in a meaningful way because the hanging on to the older practices are just so embedded in how we think about education. So making OER, using OER, I think those are uh, you know, things to explore. Uh, and in your own work, that might be something that you could consider is uh, have somebody try and make some OER so that they can understand those complexities. And then have somebody also use OER and try and uh, uh, support them as they go into the revision and the sharing out of the, you know, the second, third, fourth iterations. Connie, I just want to add, I'm, I'm looking at the, the notes here too in the discussion, and I know not to bring Leo in, but I'm going to. <laughs> um, Leo and I have had many conversations about, um, like, why are, why are we even making OER? Like, what is it about OER that has to be made, and how, how does that influence or how is that connected to open educational practice? Because I saw a comment, for example, about like an OER version of Teachers Pay Teachers, and I know that Odd Waters is doing a is having a big debate with Instagram right now over the idea of teachers who um, use Instagram and social media in order to support their current teaching practice, and so they specifically put um, different advertising and different options, uh, like teaching materials in their classroom so that, that they can gain some money in, in advertising. And when teachers aren't paid very much, I don't have any comment on that. I think everyone deserves the right to figure out what they're going to do. But actually, when we think about teach, or teachers pay teachers, Google Docs and Google Suite is the number one tool it used by K-12 teachers. That is Teachers Pay Teachers, the OER online version. I'm sorry, I can't say OER version because it doesn't have Creative Commons licensing and it doesn't use the five R's. K-12 is already doing it. We just don't call it OER. And I think that the research that Bea and the OER Hub team did on K-12 also proves this fact that they found people using YouTube, but they didn't know that that would be considered OER. Or just explaining to teachers that there's a Creative Commons license option on YouTube. And so the argument with teachers, I was talking to, um, this is where I was talking to Leo specifically, we were talking about teachers who didn't want to put a Creative Commons license on YouTube, they wanted to keep it the YouTube license. And I was asking them why, and they said, well, we don't want people to make memes or do anything with YouTube videos. Beca and because the students didn't sign off on that from the beginning, they signed off on the what in, in Alberta is our FOIP um, laws and guidelines that says, I agree to put my face in that video. But they didn't sign off for the Creative Commons license. So I think that's another question that needs to be addressed in K-12, that you have to get permissions on permission so that people understand how that work could be used, remixed, and redistributed. OK, so I'm just going to stop there, because now we're going on to question three. <laughs> Go ahead. So what influence does the word resources play within educators deeply and engaging understanding OER as part of their open learning? And for K-12, it isn't necessarily the textbook big surprise. As someone also pointed out in the chat, in, in K-12, we, we want to get away from the textbook. And as other people pointed out, it is not It is a power struggle when it's just, if you pass out, pass out a textbook, it's like one person or multiple authors in some cases perspective about an idea, whereas if you're using open educational resources in terms of multiple digital artifacts like videos, like podcasts, like images, and remixing it and playing with them, I can't even begin to see how complicated that is in terms of putting Creative Commons licenses on all the pictures that students are taking with their phones and connecting and, and putting them together. So, oh, and here we go. Leo is now jumping in finally. Thank you, Leo. This is being the difference between a legal commons and a social commons. Very, thank you for phrasing what I was trying to say. So there you go. That's my argument, the difference between a legal commons and a social commons. What do you think, Connie, on this question? Yes. Um, well, I think that what happens is that um, 
really what we're talking about is this movement uh, to open learning environments, um, participatory technologies, and um, we've talked about it in different presentations that Verena and, and I have given about this idea of for K-12, um, maybe we need to, it, the idea that it's going to be different for K-12, the concept of a walled garden um, for legal reasons has to be part of the conversation. And so um, it's a continuum. It's not necessarily all open or all closed, but it's like many things. It's a blend, and it would be something that would allow um, students and teachers to feel comfortable, um, and parents as well, and the public too, generally, because it is um, taxpayers' dollars. So they, everyone has a stake in K-12, uh, it seems, and uh, it's a very um, contentious area in some places because everyone has these opinions about what should be allowed and what, you know, what couldn't be allowed. So this idea of resources is actually a term that I think is, is some ways to me, when you talk about resources, even when you say it could be a video or it could be a podcast or a photograph, generally what people are talking about is something that's quite um, tangible and often kind of sort of equates back down to a book. And kind of what we do with books is kind of the thinking that goes around our thinking of what are open educational resources. And so this whole idea of that, um, you know, most people would not take a textbook and rip it apart and reorganize the pages because um, in their opinion, the um, publisher uh, didn't put pages 25 to 30 in the right section and uh, that it should really come at the end of pages 100 to 105. But nobody would physically tear out those pages and, and reinsert them to another section of the book. And yet, when you have digital resources, there's this um, fluidity in the actual um, materiality of the of the resource because they are digital and so I think what to me what I see is sort of like this idea like the word resource to me is just like heavy it's like thick it's just a word that we bring so much to and this is for everyone who's had any kind of formal education um, K-12 to higher ed whatever the word uh, educational resource is just so laden with this set of practices. And instead, um, when we talk about open learning and open practices, it's abstract, it's connected, it's networked, it's these nodes, it's you know tied into this whole concept of connectivism. And so, as I said, it's this, ins this substantial shift in our thinking, and although we are doing some of it, we are um, essentially unconscious about what some of those things are. We can't label it. We can't um, be concrete in our discussions around what we mean by some of these um, educational tools because um, it's things that we haven't talked about. We haven't um, reflected upon, whether it's being taught in the pre-service or as part of professional development. And so much of professional development for K-12 teachers is just still this one, you know, in your seat one day, uh, take it home and use it the next day kind of thinking. So I think the word resource to me is problematic. Now maybe this is just my own interpretation, but I just find the word resource is is uh, problematic, uh, yet I have no substitute. And I think in a way, it, it, what we name things is very important because it shapes how we work, how we, quote, do things. So um, that's some of my thinking about this word resource. So I'm looking at the time. And um, I'm looking at the comments in the box, but does anyone have some specific questions that they want to um, ask us or talk about? Oh, Bea said, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bea. 
um, yes, we, we open up for questions. So thank, I mean, thanks. This is, this is what kind of annoys me a little bit. Like when it gets really exciting, it's like when, you know, we kind of have to kind of wind down the conversation. Um, we'll open the floor for questions. We, we still have something like 10, 10 minutes or so. Um, but there's something in between, you know, guys, just start writing. But it, what I wanted to ask you is something that has been worrying me a little bit lately. And um, I wonder what is the situation over, like, your side of, of the world. And because what I'm seeing here in Europe, um, I mean, I, maybe I can generalize for the whole of Europe, but it's like this with systems um, to use technology in the classroom. Um, and I wonder to what extent, when we talk about OEP, we're also talking about the use of technology. And so how, if we're saying no to the technology in the classroom, which I think it is honestly happening in, in, in Europe, um, you know, how is that going to affect, again, growing awareness or, you know, implementing OEP in the classroom? Or I don't know, do you have any comments there? Um, for me, open educational practice has never been about like every person having their own device. It's been about using technology to connect with others uh, throughout the world. So I've been practicing openly the moment I had access to the internet. So that may, so when I see what's happening in France, for example, I think that's a really good example where they've said no cell phones in schools, for example, like it's a policy that's being mandated. First of all, that just reminds me of, I, I have actually been looking into it from a research perspective, looking at sex ed and seeing when you say like no teaching of sex, so take away <laughs> take away of the condoms in the in the in the bathrooms or take away any alcohol or so it's that taking away and that fear factor so take away the cell phones because they're just as dangerous as other things what I think we're speaking to is the fear of the addiction to the technology which is a separate issue from using technology for learning and 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 getting back to the awareness of open educational resources and the fact that we're still clarifying exactly what we mean by using open educational resources we are still not using technology for learning in a way that we could be using it and teachers are still not using technology in a way from learning but if i wasn't prevented from using that one computer to skype with teachers around the world that i i i don't think i'll ever have that fear as long as the internet is something that I am able to access. Where I think that this is a big question is as even my mother, uh, I will quote my mother and maybe she'll watch this webinar so she can hear me. Um, she was saying, but Vrina, if they, if they stop everyone from access to technology, how is that fair to the kids who don't have technology? Like how, that's just cutting down the resources. It's not improving the resources. So you're creating an equity gap. And I think that's a bigger thought process, especially when we talk about what's going on with the Global South and OER, which I think is a great conversation, and equity in general when we're talking about open um, learning and open educational practice. That is my bigger concern. This is just one more, and I'll become, I guess, kind of political in saying it, one more like hammer on the nail saying certain people are allowed to do things and other people can't. And it's because of money and, and, and not because of rational thought on how we can think about learning for the future. But like, um, like, Actually, I maybe I should be quoted for this, although I have to be very careful what I think about it. L like um, sexual education, I think it's very important that open learning is an option and, and something that all students should have access to. And so I think that's what you're getting at there, particularly, Bea, not access to digital devices but access to learning. You are taking something away. And, and that's what I think we're both scared of when you take away um, digital devices or hardware or that kind of thing. But that's just fear and control. And yeah, that, that, that's, that, yeah, but that's happening as we know everywhere. Uh, Connie, what do you have to say about that? Digital well, I, I actually see, uh, to me, it's a, a backlash against uh, the use of technology in our lives because it, 
is so pervasive. And, um, you know, in Alberta, we have some uh, research being done by the Alberta Teachers Association and uh, the Harvard Medical School regarding uh, the use of uh, cell phones and technology and, and its effects on young children especially. And those are critical questions. That's important research. Um, but to just say uh, completely, well, uh, you know, we can't be using technology in our classrooms because they just get too much of it. I don't think that's necessarily the solution. I think this is where, you know, you have to kind of think about, um, I remember when I was teaching, I'd have students at the end of the day, and sometimes I would say, okay, let's go, we're going to um, work on the computers. At that time, we had to go to the library or the lab or whatever. And um, they would be, some would complain, they'd say, well, we've been on the computers all day. And they were right. But there was no way of communicating with my, my colleagues as to, uh, are you, you know, are you going to be using the computers a lot today, et cetera, et cetera. So that there was no way, there was no structure to sort of pace out the actual exposure of being in front of the screen as part of your education. And when we get when it gets to the point of open learning, I think that some of these are practices. So I always think technology, either you know, going back to Marshall McLuhan and what he, he said about the power of of technology to, you know, um, sometimes suppress but also enhance, but also flip, and then also make obsolete certain practices. And so I think this is where our understanding of what it means to uh, live and, and teach and learn with technology is still in some ways very um, based in the physical aspect of it. And, and so this idea that if we, like in France, you know, you can't have your cell phone in, in class, and there's nothing there to really support how they're going to be living their lives outside of class. So yes, of course, there's, there can be too much of it. But how do we use it wisely? This isn't just for one person to figure out. This is for many, again, it goes back to the complexity of, of uh, K-12 schooling. And, um, you know, open learning, because of the participatory technologies, enhances many of the th practices that uh, we have as human beings. But some of those practices were around. Our p teachers may have done it, right? It's just that your capacity to do it hasn't, wasn't amplified. When a teacher took um, you know, some assignments or you know, samples of students' work and put it up on a bulletin board in a physical classroom, that's a form of public sharing. It's just that it wasn't amplified. And when parents came to come and look at those uh, samples or you had guests in the school, they could see it as well. But it wasn't accessible like it is now. So it's not that these practices haven't really been in schools. They have. They're, they've been around for quite a long time. It's the technology that amplifies it and makes it so accessible and therefore also put potentially dangerous or too much and all those kinds of things. So I think it's just easy to push back on the device itself as part of a backlash in a way. Um, I don't know how else to phrase it, but it's like, yes, it's too much. And it is too much. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying I'm not sure that that's the only kind of solution that we can come up with. Um, anything else, Bea? Any thoughts on your question? Yes. I, I don't, you see, I could go on, but I don't want to get napped there. I mean, I'm very aware of the time, and I don't want to get napped there, <laughs> the common situation. So, is anybody, is anybody, anybody would like to ask a question? Because um, we just do kind of have a couple of minutes, so let me see, because I know that Leo is typing, or he was typing. Igor is typing. So I'm just going to give them a minute. Uh, but there's so I much. Want to see, yeah, yeah. yeah, go on. Yeah. 
I was just going to say I've been looking at the chat box and, and you know throughout the presentation, and I just think the comments uh, and insights um, of our um, audience members today have been very insightful. Um, yeah, and it's uh, I can see that you care about the topic a lot as well, and have lots of good ideas too. Um, it, you know, it's uh, it sounds like people are kind of saying their goodbyes and all that. So we we will we'll wrap it up. But you know, like I, um, when I started doing research on on open educational resources and OIP, I had the ext I mean, I thought I was very lucky when I was part of the hub and I got at uh, work with you know the project was divided into doing research in schools, doing research in higher ed, doing research in community colleges, and I just got you know by chance I. I was allocated the, the doing uh, research in schools, and I've been um, fascinated, and I've been so grateful that you know that, that happened. Um, one of the things I think is that you know it's just so, it's what I was say, trying to say at the very beginning. It's so important to start at the beginning, and when you started, I mean, you, everybody starts education when well, they start education at home and all that. But it's when you go to school. So if your teachers, if your teachers start talking to you about what it is open and what is uh, sharing about, what are the implications of actually putting all this stuff out there and what's the difference between copyright and a creative common license. That sticks with you whether you like it or not, you know. So that's one, you know, it's great that there's uh, so much research going in, um, in in higher education, but, you know, we, it needs, I wish the resources and the research was actually put First in 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 K to twelve and and schools because it's just so much, mm -hmm. um, so much more important. But anyway, we're gonna we we're gonna we're gonna leave it here. Um, thank you, Verena, and thank you, Connie. Uh, you know, it's it's been fantastic. I I love the way you were kind of interacting between the two of you. I saw it's um, you know sometimes I get worried if I if we have two speakers that how is that gonna work? But it's worked really really well. Uh, you've got piles and piles of knowledge inside your heads and also your experience uh, you know having been there and having you know having done it and all that so I'm delighted that you that you uh, you know shared your your time with us so thanks thanks very much for everybody else this um, I'll soon hit the stop the recording as soon as I can I'll put a lot lost there record, recording onto YouTube and tweet a link or you know there'll always be a link on on the website anyway so okay Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It, it was. Uh, I hope people found it useful. Um, I I thought that uh, that there were some good comments from everyone. So that's that's always a good sign. It was. It was incredibly useful. So thank you both. Great. Good. Thanks, Thea. Goodbye. That's all I can say. I love you, and we'll <laughs> we will see you soon.